Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Just like South Korea is one of America's most important partners in Asia, so is the United States a key ally for South Korea. The importance of this relationship is visible. The Embassy of the United States sits right in the city center of Seoul, and more than 25,000 American soldiers are currently stationed throughout the country. In opinion surveys, South Korean states that they view the United States in a more positive light than any of their regional neighbors. An important role in the day-to-day management of this relationship is played by the diplomatic staff of the United States in South Korea. We had the unique opportunity to meet Mark Lippert, the current ambassador of the United States to South Korea, as well as his staff and his basset hound, Grigsby, in his residence in Seoul. In our brief interview, we spoke about his position and responsibilities, America's perspective on regional issues, and President Obama's pivot to Asia. Ambassador Lippert obtained his undergraduate and master's degrees from Stanford University, respectively in political science and international policy studies. Before he became ambassador to South Korea in 2014, he was chief of staff for President Obama's National Security Council and assistant secretary of defense for Asian and Pacific security affairs. U.S. Ambassador to Korea Mark Lippert, welcome to Korea and the World. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, Really excited to uh, be part of this uh, interview and podcast. First of all, how does one become American ambassador to South Korea? Well, it's a good question. My predecessors for the last 25 years have been career diplomats. They've come through the Foreign Service and that process, which is a series of boards and internal discussions. In my case, a little different, was actually approached by two senior State Department officials. And once they made the pitch to me, I was very interested, my wife was interested, and that began a process by which we went through a nomination process inside the White House. The Senate ultimately confirmed me, and uh, here I am. I would say this, finally, it's a great job. Uh, It's fantastic to be here. Korea, I'd been here many times before as an official. But, you know, business trips, you generally see hotels and ministries. And this is a real chance to live in Seoul, be among the people, and we have loved every minute of it. Is there something like a typical day in an ambassador's life? What activities take up most of your time? And do you have regular working hours? As the U.S. ambassador to Korea, there is no typical day. I would say this. I had a good friend uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Korea, and he said, you know, Mark, Korea has been traditionally called the land of morning calm. And he said, really, the more appropriate answer, it's the land of morning surprise. Uh, And I've found that to be somewhat true. It causes us to have to be nimble and more flexible. There really is no typical day. But I would say this, we tend to spend time in the embassy on a range of issues from security to economics to -to people-to-people diplomacy to dealing with things such as our global diplomatic partnership. And that ranges from doing things here in Seoul, being down in Busan, being other parts of the country. So really, it's a blend of issues. There really isn't a typical workday or even a what we would call in the military a battle rhythm. It's really a product of us, our strategic planning, that's one element, and two, reacting to events. And then three, uh, I think also taking advantage of uh, some of the invitations and contacts we hear, have around town. And those three things really drive us and our schedule here at Embassy Seoul. How much independence or agency do you have as an ambassador, for example, with regards to commenting on domestic politics? Well, we really try to avoid commenting on domestic politics here in Korea. That's for the Koreans to do themselves. And moreover, the Koreans have a very vibrant, robust democracy that is perfectly capable of debating uh, and addressing the issues of the Korean people. You know, where we spend a, tend to spend our time is on the bilateral and multilateral issues. And there are a number of those issues. We work cooperatively on issues both here in Korea. We work cooperatively on issues in the region. And more and more, we work on issues that affect the world. So there is plenty of things to talk about and do together that extend beyond uh, domestic Korean politics. The relations between South Korea and the United States are shaped by friendship, trust and gratefulness on the one hand, but also anti-American sentiments on the other hand. How do you deal with this bipolar situation as ambassador and do you try to engage critics? Well, I think that this dichotomy is a little bit of a relic of the past. 
Right now, the United States' public approval in Korea ranges from 80 to 90 percent, depending on which questions and which caveat you put into the question. But the polling data shows strong support for the U.S. ROK relationship here in Korea. So it's less of a 50-50 proposition. In terms of your question about critics, we tend to engage people from all walks of life. I have done a number of town halls at universities. I meet with people in industry. I try to engage people in a range of different settings to hear hear the varied views of Korean people, not just about the United States, but about Korea's place in the world and other things we could do cooperatively together. It's actually some of our best source of ideas that we gather at the embassy is after these meetings, taking them back and trying to harness and improve the bilateral relationship. South Korea's relations with Japan suffer from the persistence of historical and territorial disputes. Considering that both countries are major American allies in the region, do these issues feature in your work as ambassador? Well, there's no doubt there are very difficult, important historical issues between South Korea and Japan. We in the United States know that these are important issues. President Obama, when he visited here in Korea in 2014, for example, called the treatment of the the comfort women shocking. So we do take note of the importance of these issues. We in the United States don't try to force or mediate resolution of these types of issues, but we do encourage and do encourage our two friends who have two governments, two capable countries to work these out cooperatively and collaboratively in a way that promotes peace, healing and reconciliation in the region. You were a member of President Barack Obama's National Security Council at the start of his presidency in 2009, the year after he announced the American pivot to Asia. Yet, as some commenters argue, nothing much has come of it so far. What is your view of the relationship between the president's rhetoric and actions? Well, I think your, your point on rhetoric is important because the actions speak loudly. Uh, you look across every facet of the relationship and the rebalance uh, has improved virtually every facet and our focus towards the Asia Pacific region. And that's not just in terms of doing more speeches, that's in terms of real resources and tangible results. Let me just give you a few examples. Obviously on the economic side, the United States was a leader in negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. That was a critical deal and we're obviously still working through ratification, but we did reach the deal at the executive level. The second point I would make in terms of diplomatic outreach, you look at the number of multilateral agents or organizations we've joined or become more engaged in. We, for example, stood up a new permanent mission to ASEAN. We have joined the EAS and the president has been at virtually every one of these summits. And that's not to mention all the representations by the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense and other senior level cabinet level officials, what you will see is that diplomatic activity has increased dramatically. And finally, I would say on the defense side, uh, you look at Secretary Panetta's speech in 2012 that really bears this out. 60% of the Navy is moving to the Pacific. 60% of the Air Force is moving to the Pacific. We have brought our best platforms here to the Pacific. We have brought our best people here to the Pacific. And we are updating our doctrine, our plans, and our efforts bilaterally here in Korea, but all over the Asia Pacific region. Looking back to President Obama's early days in the White House, is it reasonable to assume that the president had different plans for the American policy towards Asia and that if so many resources had not been devoted to the Middle East, he would have done even more so in East Asia? Well, I think every American president comes in with the understanding that there are things that you want to do strategically and there are events you are going to have to react to on a day-to-day basis. And in the Asia-Pacific region, I think what you've seen is the president's continued focus on this region from day one all the way to his current day in office. You look at some of the early things he did. The, our three treaty allies, their leaders, were in the Oval Office within the first six months of the president taking office. The president's first state dinner was with the prime minister of India. And then fast forward to where we are today. uh, And what I would say is the president just finished a trip here in the Asia Pacific region. uh, And as well as all the other tangible results from TPP to defense spending to our diplomatic activity have been augmented throughout that intervening period. So I think, look, the president's strategy came in with a plan. He is executing his plan and he continues in a fulsome way to make progress on the Asia Pacific rebalance. And I think that'll continue till the very last day in office. Let's conclude by looking at the future. American politics is currently dominated by the upcoming presidential elections, and some have called into question some of the pillars of the relationship between America and South Korea. 
Might the relation between the two countries be at a crossroad of sort? Well, I think the answer is no. And I think, in part, you put your uh, finger on it in the question. The pillars, there are strong structures in this uh, relationship that have been built not just yesterday, not just a year ago, but over the course of 63 years. Our, our security treaty with the Republic of Korea, our free trade agreement, now our one, two, three civil nuclear agreement, our space agreement, these are lasting structures that are in place. I'd say that's point one. The second point is the strong support of our two peoples. In a democracy, our politicians listen to our two peoples, and our two peoples, if you look at the polling data on both sides of the Pacific, is very strong for this relationship. And finally, what I would say is this alliance, this relationship has been through thick and thin, and it always seems to get stronger over time. And I think based on past performance, I would prognosticate that that's the future direction uh, of the US ROK alliance over time, strength, peace, and prosperity. Ambassador Lippert, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure, and uh, I'm just glad uh, Grigsby didn't interfere with our recording session. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.